Good afternoon. Uh, I hope you are ready for another inspiring session as we had this morning. Thanks to the insights that will be given to us by our two speakers, uh, Professor uh, Bylance and Bishop Hill. So I'm glad to start presenting our first speaker. Should any one of you doubt about the importance of canon law perspectives in fostering Christian unity, Professor Violence will prove you wrong. <laughs> As, um, she will be speaking on walking together in discerning the Holy Spirit, canonical possibilities, opportunities, and challenges. She's professor of canon law at Erfurt University, where she was also formerly vice president. She's member of the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches. And within the commission, um, she has also been recently involved in, uh, as co-moderator, co-convener, and co-editor of the huge project of the commission on moral discernment and the churches. She's member of Arctic 3. And another key field of her expertise is her involvement uh, in the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minor. And she has not only published guidelines on the issue, but also she has been researching widely, and she's still researching on such a delicate issue. Last but not least, she's consultant for the Synod. And so we are very happy and honored that she will be with us tonight to present her, us her perspective. Professor Wylance, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for your kind introduction. And thank you also, uh, Father Jim Pugliesi, for the invitation to speak here today at this very inspiring conference. What the Lord is asking of us is already in some sense present in the very word synod. Journeying together, laity, pastors, the Bishop of Rome, is an easy concept to put into words, but not so easy to put into practice. End of quote. With these words, Pope Francis commemorated the 50th anniversary of the Synod of Bishops on October 17, 2015. On March 7, 2020, it was announced that the next Synod of Bishops would be on synodality and would be entitled for a synodal church, communion, participation, mission. On September 7, 2021, the preliminary document was published. It opens with the words, the Church of God is convoked in Synod. A few days ago, on October 10, Pope Francis solemnly inaugurated the Synod for the entire Church. And this common weekend, the Synodal process will begin when bishops in their own dioceses around the world will open this Synod as well. It is a Synod of the entire Church. As the preliminary document writes in the opening paragraph, one fundamental stage will be the celebration of the 16th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops in October 2023, which will be followed by the implementation phase that will again involve the particular churches. So oh, what we see here are two unique points that warrant a further reflection. First, the document speaks about the synod for the entire church, not just the synod of bishops. And second, in the process we see here, a unique implementation of the doctrine that the church exists in and from the local churches. It is not a one-way direction, and I will return to these both aspects. What lies ahead is rather unique. The task of the church is at the same time the resource. The object is at the same time the method. All are invited to experience, not just to understand, but to experience synodality so that a conversion from a hierarchical to a synodal church can occur. A conversion that will lead to a change in the way the people of God interact with each other. 
Hence, in the church, in the synod, the church may reap some of the fruits of a synodal conversion as all engage in inspiring it, reflecting upon it, and sharing it. The intention is that this will enlighten all in grasping what it means to be a more synodal church. The hope is that the synod will assist each and every baptized person to discover more deeply the meaning of baptism, which calls us to experience and live communion, to participate more fully in the life of the church, and to engage more deeply in the missionary task that each baptized as an individual enjoys and that the community as such has. To be a more synodal church is a prerequisite for discerning the working of the Holy Spirit for and in our time. As Pope Francis puts it, and I quote, it is precisely this part of synodality which God expects of the church in the third millennium. And as the church walks the journey, it takes another step in the reception of the Second Vatican Council. The step gives in particular shape to the doctrine that find expression in the dogmatic constitution on the Church Lumen Gentium, chapter 2, entitled The People of God, and the dogmatic constitution on Revelation Dei Verbum. Key words in this area are baptism, people of God, census fidelium, Holy Spirit. I will return to that. The synod for the entire church, which begins in the local churches, whether they belong to the Latin church or to one of the 23 Eastern churches sui juris, provides an occasion to discern together and offer valuable elements with regard to the strength and achievements, as well as the limitations and challenges of being a synodal church. Hence, the first step consists of the local churches as communities of faithful, journeying together under the guidance of their diocesan bishops by listening to and sharing their experience of what it means to be a synodal church. Theologically, we can say that there is hope that the at times too exclusive Christological foundation of in particular exercising leadership in the church will be complemented by an increased pneumatological one. The main question for the first stage of the Synod in this process is how do we encounter the Holy Spirit guiding the Church as it journeys to fulfill its unique mission to proclaim the good news here and now, wherever we live? Indeed, the purpose of the Synodal process is ultimately not a mere inward looking, but the consultation occurs in view of being more deeply the Church of Christ, so as to live communion, active participation, in order to proclaim with integrity and effectively the gospel, that is, to be a missionary church. Such a task cannot be envisioned without an ecumenical dimension. The commitment of the Second Vatican Council to the restoration of Christian unity implies that all processes and reflections occur while keeping in mind this fundamental task. Ecumenism does not come as an add-on, but needs to be part of what is to occur. Synod and synodality, the two terms might cause confusion. Whereas synod presupposes synodality, synodality itself is not limited to holding synods. Synods are but one form or expression among many others to practice synodality. Being a synodal church finds also expression through consultation and participation in discerning processes as they occur, for example, in presbyteral councils, as well as in diocesan and parish councils, in diocesan synods, as well as in plenary and particular councils, and also in consultations beyond these formal structures. However, being an acting synodal goes beyond formal structures. It's indeed encountering, listening, discerning, deciding. Indeed, engaging together in encountering God and the other by listening to the word of God and sharing the experience that comes from it, followed by discerning together 
as we read and understand the experience in light of reading the signs of the times, discerning what the Holy Spirit asks from us here and now, which is followed by taking a decision. Synodality in its deeper sense is just an integral internal disposition of how Christians together interact while arriving at a decision. To enable this more easily, structures and institutions help. There are therefore different articulations of synodality. There is the style, that is the modus vivendi and operandi, with which the people of God live and work. It touches on an internal disposition. There are the structures and processes governed by theology and canon law which are to facilitate listening and discerning. As a canon lawyer, it is necessary to articulate a caution here. No matter how well these institutions are governed by law, even if they are obligatory, if there is no internal disposition to appreciate synodality, to live synodality in them, they can even impede synodality because their title would suggest that they are synodal, whereas in fact the person does not practice this. And third, so behind, beside the style, the structures and the processes, we have the specific synodal events convoked by the competent authority involving all to discern the way forward. The Secretariat of Synod of Bishops published, as I said, the preliminary document on September 7th. The document recalls that the journeying together can be understood from two perspectives that are interconnected. The first concerns the internal life of the churches. It's between all faithful laity, clergy, religious, and the pastors, and it has also an ecumenical dimension because we share in the gift of baptism. The second considers journeying together with the whole human family. It focuses on relations with people of other religions, with people who are distant from the faith, and with people of specific social environments and groups, the world of culture, economics, finance, as well as the poor and the excluded. Now, before entering into some of the theological and canonical issues, I'd like to convey a bit of a flavor and atmosphere of the process that lies ahead of us. In order to facilitate the listening and consultative processes, the preliminary document presents ten thematic nuclei that articulate different aspects of synodality. They present topics that need to be addressed by the people of God in the local churches. However, the way they are addressed needs to be adapted to the local circumstances. And here we see the need for local uh, context and enculturation, which is also new. It's, it's clearly giving space. You can't do things the same way in Canada and in Rwanda. The questions focus on, for example, who are we as church? Who is the we and who is not included in this? How do we listen and with what kind of attitude and prejudices? For example, with regard to youth, to women, to minorities. Second, all are invited to speak, but what kind of style of communication do we have? Do we allow all to speak up freely and with courage? A third point, a journeying together is only possible when it is based on communal listening to the word and the celebration of the Eucharist. How do prayer and liturgical celebrations inspire and direct the journey and decision-making? Fourth aspect, all are responsible for the mission of the church. How is each baptized person called to be a protagonist in this? And how are these people supported by the community when they engage in science, in politics, or care for creation? What modes of dialogues do we have? Do we handle the, how do we handle divisions and divergences? Who are the other Christians with whom we live in the same territory and what relation do we have with them? What fruits and difficulties came to the fore in journeying together with them? When we have to make and take decisions, how do we identify the goals to be pursued, the way to achieve them and the steps to be taken? How is authority being exercised? How do teamwork and co-responsibility unfold? 
how are lay ministries and the assumption of the responsibility of the faithful promoted? How do synodal bodies of the local level function? And further questions are, what procedures and methods do we use to make decisions while listening to the Holy Spirit? How do we promote participation in decision making within hierarchically structured communities? How do we articulate the consultative phase with the deliberative one? So the question of decision making and taking. How and with what tools do we promote transparency and accountability? And finally, and almost as a prerequisite for all the above, how do we form people to lift the practice of journeying together, of listening, of discerning? So the first phase of the Synod is a consultation in the local churches in which experience, listening and discerning of all faithful under the guidance of the Holy Spirit are central in view of the mission of the church. To assist the churches in this, in this process, a handbook of Father Makem has been developed. And it's available on the internet in different translations. In what follows, I like to reflect on some theological underlying aspects that have canonical implications and present some challenges. I can see a number of subjects that would need attention, but can only touch on them uh, on a few, and I, and I also like to say a little bit about canon law and canon lawyers towards the end of this presentation. So which are, for example, subjects in need of further reflection that I think um, that has to be done by the theologians and canon lawyers worldwide. First, the synod of the entire church and the synod of bishops. Is this a change from one to the other? And if so, what, change, what is this change all about? What is the theological background for it? And most importantly, how does this change relate to Vatican II? A second aspect that I will attend to is the interaction of the local church and the entire church. We see a new process unfolding, but what does this mean ecclesiologically? Three, we hear time and again, we are not a democracy and we are not a parliament. Why is this repeated and what does it mean? As a fourth aspect, the notions of representation, reflection and giving witness, or putting it in other terms, terms, who speaks actually on behalf of whom and with what kind of authority. A fifth aspect is the participation, it's the notion of participation, the need to attend to the relation between what we call in theological canonical terms the sacra potestas and the tria mundara. And the final point that uh, I will briefly touch on is accountability in a similar world church. Is listening sufficient? Now, all these six topics would deserve a lecture on their own, if not a whole book. Um, so today I will mainly speak about the first ones, um, not even all six of them extensively, but we will see how far we will get. So the synod of the entire church and the synod of bishops. The opening words of the preliminary document is, the church of God is convoked in synod. The Church of God is convoked in Synod. Pope Francis has opened the Synod on October 10, 2021. The logo is clearly Synod 21-23. So it is not the Synod of 2023. It's the Synod of 2021-2023. And that was a very conscious decision that was made. So in the Father Macon, we can read, I have it here. Hence the synod process is no longer only an assembly of bishops, but a journey for all the faithful in which every local church has an integral part to play. The Second Vatican Council reinvigorated the sense that all the baptized both the hierarchy and the laity are called to be active participants in the saving mission of the Church Lumen Gentium 32-33. So what is really happening here? In order to understand, 
um, what is happening, it is necessary to return to Vatican II. And actually, we have to go back to Vatican I. Because at Vatican I, Vatican I spoke about the papacy and was unable to attend to the role of the bishops and the college of bishops in relation to the papacy. This was both with respect to the primacy of jurisdiction and with regard to the infallible teaching of the Pope, or we can also say the infallible teaching of the magisterium, by which magisterium is a difficult term. Um, it's, it's not so good to use that term, but anyway. Vatican II had us to attend to this. This was a major issue on the agenda, and it did so, we heard this morning in the presentation of Professor Le Grand uh, in Chapter 3 of Lumen Gentium. The doctrine of collegiality of bishops used to clarify, and there was then used this, this doctrine of collegiality of bishops, and it clarified that this was that bishops are member of the College of Bishops by their ordination and being in full communion. And we heard it this morning, the attachment to the local church was not developed, and that will cause problems later on. It was clarified in Vatican II that the Pope alone, or the College of Bishops with the Pope, but not without the Pope, is the supreme authority in the Church. It can teach infallibly. The Bishop, as Vicar of Christ for his diocese, was also clarified. He's not the Vicar of the Pope, he is the Vicar of Christ for his diocese. So that was a clarification on the level of doctrine. At the same time, while the bishops were meeting here in Rome, they had an experience of what it means to be a church all over the world coming from so many different parts. And they felt that it was good that the Pope was not, would not be isolated for the future. They felt that it would be good that bishops could hear the experience of the entire church and not only see their own little experience. And so they ask, in combination with this doctrine of the collegiality of bishops and the experience, how can we, how can we continue this somehow without, or while realizing that a council could not be held so often? So the response is both a response to doctrine and experience, and they decided to create a new body that would enable regular meetings. And one of the questions they had was, what would be the power of that body? And that was very controversially discussed. Could it have deliberative power, yes or no? And because there were so many questions about this, Pope Paul VI did not leave it to the council to establish this body, but he erected it himself just prior to the council city in 1965 and intended for regular meetings of a representation of the College of Bishops. A representation of the College of Bishops. So the composition is then done with the help, so how did you get that representation? They said, well, let's just ask the Episcopal Conference to send a few, and we say, if you have less than 25 people, you can send one, and if you have up to 100 members, you can send three. And in this way, they thought they would have a good representation. So the Episcopal Conference is only a vehicle to secure a certain kind of representation, reflection, whatever you call it. The underlying notion, not the local church, but the membership of the College of Bishops. That is the basis for the Synod of Bishops. So, and because of the feared opposition, Pope Paul VI decided he would have only a consultative vote unless otherwise determined. The conclusion, the Synod of Bishops gives expression to the doctrine of the relationship between Pope and Bishops as members of the College of Bishops. It does not intend to give expression to the doctrine between the local church and the entire church, let alone to give somehow expression to the rest of the people of God. However, Vatican II, after or while having, while having that chapter 3, made a very conscious decision to include a chapter on the people of God, and not only to include that, but to have it inserted before the hierarchy. So that the distinctions between hierarchy, laity, and religious are made subsequently. The idea was to express what all baptized hold in common, that all faithful together make up the people of God due to being baptized in Christ. Hence, here the expression of the relation to the other Christians and non-baptized. 
It is also in this chapter that we find something about the infallibility of the church, not just about the bishops. And it was made clear so that we have also the terminology of census fidei fidelium. And um, it was also made clear in this chapter that the church as such and as a whole has a missionary task and that the hierarchy therefore stands in service to all of this. So, chapter 3, collegiality, you get a synod. Chapter 2, inserted before to summarize from everything together. And now we have a problem because chapter 3 was never reworked in light of chapter 2. And that results in what our good friend Hermann Joseph Pottmeier would say in juxtapositions. So the doctrine stands side by side without being brought into a new synthesis. And that results in people taking what they like. Now, regretfully, we heard that this morning too, the canon lawyers tended to lean in many of these aspects later on for the legislation to go with chapter 3 and not to kind of solve the, the jurisdiction, the, the juxtaposition. So the translation of Vatican II into the Code of Canon Law is often one-sided or certainly incomplete. Needed would be a hermeneutical rereading of chapter 3 in light of chapter 2. And that would then have consequences for canon law, both with regard to interpreting existing structures and creating new ones. What is the deeper cause for this new understanding that we find in chapter 2 of Lumen Gentium? I think we, we need to go one level deeper than just chapter 2. That new understanding lies um, with revelation and with teaching authority. So again, if we go one step back, the Council of Trent, um, as of the Council of Trent, we understand the revelation as a transmission of faith in a hierarchically ordered way, from God to Jesus to Peter and the other apostles, to the Pope, to the bishops, to the priests, and the laity who then receive it in obedience. And the method used is faith is a matter of propositions. So then we get catechisms that people have to learn by heart. Vatican II changed a lot of that. It did not think from doctrine as a set, it did not think in Dei Verbum, uh, um, it's not a set of doctrines, but God, and this I think is a beautiful phrase, God speaks to people as friends to enter into fellowship with them. Dei Verbum number two. It is an encounter, that's another word, and the word encounter we have heard over the past days in, in the Synod, in the context of the Synod, in the study days we had afterwards, time and again, the word encounter comes back. An encounter of men and women with God. The Holy Spirit leads us into relationship and understanding, Dei Verbum 5. And this is therefore not a Christo-monistic, but a Trinitarian approach. The word of God is listened to and heard by all, including the ordained. Including the ordained. The reflection on Saturday, this would have been unthinkable before Vatican II. The reflection on Saturday, um, the Pope was there, the first scripture was brought in, and before anybody else said something, the word of God was read. So we, the whole church is placed under the word of God. Church is a listening church before it becomes a proclaiming and teaching church. The doctrine expressed is it begins with listening not to each other, but together to the word of God, which is directed to all people. This whole process can only be understood under guidance of the Holy Spirit through a complex interaction of all the faithful, each and every one, according to his position, his or her position and function. This understanding touches on the notion of tradition. Tradition occurs through all the faithful. Lumen Gentium uses for this the, terms sensus, the term sensus fidei fidelium, the sense of the faith of all faithful. And this then has consequences for the infallibility of the church. The church as such is infallible, which was almost reversed to an invalibility of the magisterium to be active and an invalibility of the church that was, to be redu was reduced to being passive. So there was almost a danger of an invalibility of the church to be dependent on the infallibility of the magisterium instead of the other way around. 
So Vatican II clarifies, revelation occurs within the people of God in a complex network of relations between all faithful, from laypersons to bishops. And this can only be appreciated in light of the doctrine that true baptism, all faithful participate in the threefold ministry of Christ and receive, receive charisms, as well as the doctrine that the Holy Spirit is active in each and every one, and that the Holy Spirit will guide the process. So from this flows the doctrine that the Holy Spirit does not work in isolation, but that different people are dependent on each other. The individual cannot believe without the community. And at the same time, the common faith lives in the lift faith of the faithful. There it finds its most comprehensive and most diverse expression. Hence, the living faith is an important witness and source of faith and thus a locus theologicus. Hence, there is a need for mutual obedience and respect of laity and hierarchy. And this finds expression in Lumen Gentium 12, the entire body of faithful cannot err in matters of faith. The believing church, the church in Credendo, is infallible. Discernment in matters of faith is aroused and sustained by the spirit of truth, and it is all exercised under the guidance of the sacred teaching authority. This means that the infallibility of pope and bishops is embedded within the infallibility of the church. The infallibility in docendo falls within the infallibility in credendo. Now what does this have to do with the synod that just has begun? Whereas in the context of the doctrine of collegiality in relation to the papacy and the experience that it is beneficial for the church to discern together, Pope Paul VI had established the synod of bishops. And this, as I said earlier, finds expression, finds its origin in chapter 3 of Lumen Gentium. Pope Francis, however, while seeking for a form to give expression to the insights as expressed in chapter 2 of Lumen, Gentium, of Lumen Gentium on the people of God, and all it entails, concludes that there is a need for a journeying together. Whereas in the past, the synods on the family, the youth and the Amazon, the listening occurred before the synod, the Pope has now integrated this into the synod itself. With this, the synod thus has become an expression not just of the doctrine on collegiality of bishops, but of the people of God. Within the synod, there will then be, and this is the language that you will find in these two documents, I mean, if you are, if your eyes are now trained to it, you will see it. Um, there will then be an assembly of the Synod of Bishops in 2023. Thus, in a way, the doctrine that finds expression in chapter 3 of Lumen Gentium is now integrated into the new structure. Hence, we have the Synod of 2021, 2023, and the assembly will meet in 2023. So this, I, I remember when the, the discussion we had about the logo, because it would be a major ecclesiological change, and the change was um, taken. So that's the first. Are we talking about the synod of the entire church? Uh, and then again, I think it's quite something. The church of God is convoked in synod, not the bishop synod, the church of God. The second aspect, the interaction of the local church and the church universal. So there is more to it. Vatican II affirmed that, and we heard some of that this morning, I think we are really beautifully uh, complementing each other. The local church is fully church, Lumen Gentium 26, that the church is a portion of the people of God. It's a portion, we heard that this morning too, not a part of the entire church. It affirms that the church exists in and from the local churches. The one cannot be thought of without the other. Henri Le Grand has explained this well over the years. And I, I remember, I hope I remember it correctly, that you use for that the image of a cake. You cannot have the cake without the portions, and each portion at the same time contains the fullness of that cake. So the synod now begins in the local churches, and there will be an interaction from the local church to the entire church. You may recall, Vatican II was successful because the local churches were able to bring their fruits to the benefit of the church universal. 
to the entire church. The Germans made their contribution, for example, in the area of liturgy. The French made a tremendous contribution with the studies they had done on the church fathers. From the United States came important contribution thinking about freedom of religion. And all these, so many of these um, fruits that were brought to the council came from experience. And they were offered to the others who then also encountered them and received them for the entire church. In a discernment process, the fruits offered could be pondered about, and they were, th and what was good was given to the whole church. This was followed by a process of reception back into the local churches. The inquibus et exquibus was a flowing movement. Something similar is now about to happen, beginning in the local churches, under the leadership of the bishop. The people of God in prayer discern what the Spirit has to say of how we can be God's church in our time and in our place. That's why we need the adaptation to the local circumstances. This will require a careful and prayerful listening. The bishops, on behalf of the dioceses, will share the results with the bishops who head to the other local churches in the Episcopal Conference. Remarkably, the documents do say that the report by the bishop is to be a faithful report of what has happened in the diocese and that it is not to be what the bishop thinks the entire church or the pope wants to hear. It is also not the report of the so it's also not the report of the local of the diocesan bishop, but it's the report of the local church. It is thus the report of the communio fidelium in the local church. The bishop gives us witness to the faith of his local church, and he gives witness to the joys, the pain, the challenges, the hopes. The bishops within an Episcopal conference are subsequently invited to discern together, this is also new, they have to discern together the results coming from the local churches in what it means for the territory of their conference. In a year's time, the reports of the Episcopal conferences will be the basis for an instrumentum laboris number one, which will be the basis for further reflection in continental structures. Now that too is a further step. And um, so we, we now have finally a recognition of these continental structures, like the CELAM, the Federation CELAM for South America, the Federation of Asian Bishops' Conferences, the Council of the um, Episcopal Conferences of Europe, um, the African one. So we, we have this intermediate level there too. And it's remarkable that these structures will be involved as it is a recognition of the complexity and diversity of the world. Based on the reports, then, from several different parts of the world, Instrumentum Laboris number 2 will be written, which is to be the basis for the Assembly of Bishops in 2023. This will be followed, and now this is interesting too, by the implementation phase that will again involve the local churches. Um, can you see here? And the document says to that, um, the implementation is intended to reach all the local churches throughout the world so that the synodal process has the entire people of God as its point of departure as well as its point of arrival. You'll find it in, in 3.5. Indeed, the inquibus and exquibus will become a flowing mechanism. The whole structure strengthens the relation between the local and the entire church. It will give expression to the Catholicity of the church. As Lumen Gentium number 13 states, between all the parts of the church there remains a bond of close communion whereby they share spiritual riches, apostolic works, works and temporal resources. For the members of the people of God are called to share these goods in common, and of each of the churches the words of the apostle hold good, according to the gift that each has received, administer it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 
So in many ways, the interactive process will give a new relevance to the diocesan bishop, as more than ever before will he be the witness to the fate of the local church entrusted to his care. It also highlights maybe for the first time the relationship between the communio fidelium, communio ecclesiarum, and communio episcoporum. And yet, something else comes to the fore which we touched upon this morning, the role of the titular bishops. These are those bishops who do not have the pastoral care for a specific local church. Some of them are auxiliary bishops who assist the diocesan bishop in the pastoral care of the diocese. Others um, are retired bishops or bishops who are, for example, working in the Roman Curia or in apostolic nunciatures. All these bishops are due to the ordination member of the College of Bishops. Hence, as long as the Synod of Bishops was a gathering, was a gathering of bishops belonging to the college, uh, the meaning of the synod therefore differs. Now that it is moving to reflect much more the trias communio fidelium, communio ecclesiarum, communio episcoporum, the role of the titular bishop needs a careful theological reflection with possible canonical implications. In a way, this is also the case because when the synod of bishops came about in 65, the church had no experience with retired bishops, and the balance of diocesan bishops in relation to titular bishops was quite different. A third aspect, not a democracy, not a parliament. Time and again, one can hear in the context of synods that the church is not governed by the dynamics of democracy but that it is, and that it is not a parliament. The preliminary document writes, and I quote, the consultation of the people of God does not imply the assumption within the church of the dynamics of democracy based on the principle of majority, because there is, as the basis of participation in every synodal process, a shared compassion for the common mission of evangelization and not the representation of conflicting interests. That was the preliminary document. Saturday, Pope Francis said, I want to say, and he said it quite at the beginning of his presentation, I want to say that the Synod is not a parliament or an opinion poll. The Synod is an ecclesial event and its protagonist is the Holy Spirit. If the Spirit is not present, there will be no Synod. Now what can these warnings mean? Some might quickly say, in the church we do not vote. Others think voting in synods would be um, restricted or in particular reflect the Protestant traditions and oh, oh. Now the truth is that in many ecclesial bodies within the Catholic Church there is voting also on matters of faith. In Vatican II there was even a very advanced system of electronic voting. Olivetti already prepared that whole system. In plenary councils and episcopal conferences, there is voting not only on business matters, such as statutes or elections, for which of course you need a voting, but also on doctrinal questions. And yet, the purpose seems to be to obtain not just the required majority, but consensus. Vatican II says as well in Lumen Gentium, the entire body of the faithful, anointed as they are by the Holy One, cannot err in matters of faith, of belief. They manifest this special property by means of the whole people's supernatural discernment in matters of faith when from the bishops down to the last of the lay faithful. They show universal agreements in matters of faith and moral. That discernment in matters of faith is aroused, aroused and sustained by the spirit of truth." End of quote. It means that in matters of belief, the community seeks consensus, which is not the same as unanimity. Uh, the document on Episcopal Conferences, Apostle Sue regretfully speaks about unanimity. Um, whereas unanimity, as well as a majority, originates from the world of law, consensus can be understood as referring to a discernment process under the guidance of the Holy Spirit where the truth is found. It often involves a time-consuming and painstaking process characterized by mutual listening. It implies that there is a need and space for an extensive discussion about subject concerns in which there is ample space for a true disputatio in which different arguments accompanied by prayer are brought forward and considered carefully. 
Consensus in a, is a manifestation of God's participation in the discernment process. The Council of Jerusalem witnesses to this. It means that all participate, but it does not mean that all speak with the same authority. That's, that's again another question. In this context, one can be reminded of the principle quod omnes tangit ab omnibus debet approbari. So what concerns all should be considered by all and discussed by all. This arriving at consensus, which could be a moral consensus, is quite different from merely counting votes or determining a majority. In this regard, the 2018 Apostolic Constitution Episcopalis Communio on the Synod of Bishops is of interest because it emphasizes that in the church there is the need for a consensus in the sense of a morally unanimous vote. It does not speak about the juridic unanimity. I quote, in the church the purpose of any collegial body is always the search for truth or the good of the church. But it is therefore a question involving the faith itself. The consensus ecclesiae is not determined by the tallying of votes, but is the outcome of the working of the spirit, the soul of the one church of Christ, end of quote. The section of Episcopalis Communio concludes by stating that the votes of the Synod Fathers, and I quote, if morally unanimous has a qualified ecclesial weight, which surpasses the merely formal aspect of the consultative vote. The topic of majority and consensus is not only of concern to the Roman Catholic Church. Since 2005, the World Council of Churches has adopted this method insofar as the decision concerns topics related to faith. So we don't have to be too afraid that this is too Protestant. Huh? I come from Geneva. It does not use a parliamentary in Geneva in the World Council. It does not use a parliamentary model. The reasoning is quite remarkable. I quote, the World Council of Churches is called to be a witness to unity in a world which is marked by tensions, antagonism, conflicts, war, and rumors of war. In this situation, the Council can be a witness, not only by its programs and solutions, but also by the way it does business. It can shape its rules and procedures in such a way as to express faith made effective and love. This means that member churches, as well as representatives of those churches, will treat each other with respect and will seek to build one another up in love. Some churches around the world and some parts of the Council itself have found that making decisions by consensus is a better way of reflecting the nature of the Church as described in the New Testament than in the parliamentary approach. In the first letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul speaks of parts of the body needing each other. A fully functioning body integrates the gifts of all its members. Similarly, any ecumenical body will function best when it makes optimum use of the abilities, his history, experience, commitment, and spiritual tradition of all the members. Consensus procedures allow more room for consultation, exploration, questioning, and prayerful reflection, with less rigidity than formal voting procedures. By promoting collaboration rather than adversarial debate, consensus produces Procedures help the assembly or a commission or committee to seek the mind of Christ together. Rather than striving to succeed in debate, participants are encouraged to submit to one another to seek to understand what the will of the Lord is. The consensus model for decision making also encourages prayerful listening to one another and growth in understanding between ecclesial traditions. At the same time, it requires discipline on the part of participants and moderators. There must also be rules, but the aim is to arrive at a common mind rather than simply the will of the majority. When consensus is declared, this is the document of the WCC, when consensus is declared, all who have participated can confidently affirm it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. I believe that this aspect would need careful consideration and study, but it would be worthwhile, um, especially as Cardinal Mario Greg, Secretary General of the Synod of Bishops, mentions, uh, as he mentioned this last Saturday, and this text I believe is not published on the internet, as one aspect to consider for the Synod and the Assembly of Bishops. Can we, do we, should we maybe move to a consensus? There was a question here raised. 
Such a study should attend to another aspect that would need attention that might well be implied when reference is made that the church is not a parliament. I'm thinking of the so-called lobby groups. This too is not foreign to the church as it finds already mentioned in scripture. There is a need to secure that all voices can be heard and not only those who have sufficient money to use the media and other forms of modern technology. I come to my fourth point. The notions of representation, reflection, and giving witness. Or putting it in other terms, who speaks on behalf of whom with what kind of authority? This topic group touches on the role, the function, and tasks, not only of bishops in a synod or an episcopal conference, but also of all consultative bodies in the diocese and parish. The question is, should they have, should, um, should all these bodies have a faithful, a good representation of the diocese or the parish, or should they rather reflect the diocese or parish? Interestingly, the law states that the Presbyteral Council should represent the priests of the dioceses, whereas the diocesan council should reflect the entire people of God in the diocese. But what do these terms mean, and what does it mean for the people who participate in decision-making and taking in these bodies? Do they speak for themselves and express their own faith, or do they speak on behalf of certain groups? Do bishops in an Episcopal conference witness to the faith of their church, or do they express their own views in light of their personal belief? The questions are of theologically great relevance. A fifth point, which is going to be extremely complicated but absolutely necessary, is participation. The need to attend to the relation between the Zakra Potestas and the Tria Munara. A major topic that indubitably will arise in the context of a more synodal church is the question of the relation between the power of orders and jurisdiction, as well as the participation in the three munera. It's a rather complex subject, and I think this subject will also include the question of women and voting. The whole role of women is included in this subject. If you look at the question, of course I cannot, I mean, I would need a whole afternoon to speak about this, but... Um, what is remarkable, if you attend to the literature, it usually begins with the question, can a person who is not a priest, who is not ordained, do this? So it begins with the question of what you are not. Now, if you begin with something which you don't bring, it's always difficult. And um, already 20 years ago, I wrote an article on this question saying, I think the question is probably phrased in the wrong way, and we should probably begin is, what does baptism enable us to do? What does baptism mandate us to do? So what does it mean to participate in a threefold ministry of Christ? And also, what does it mean that a lay person, and also a priest in some situations, would receive a mandate from the bishop to do something? What does that really mean theologically? Now, the issue of the Sacra Potestas is a very complicated issue in Vatican II. Um, it's a major discussion between the so-called Munich School and the Roman School. Remarkably, the Munich School said that the lay people after the Council could not participate in the Sacra Potestas, whereas the Roman School said it could. Everybody would expect exactly the opposite, but the German, the Munich School, had a different opinion about this. The historical, the Romans used an historical argument and said, women um, have, women abbesses have granted faculties to priests to hear confession. There have been popes who were not ordained bishops yet, but exercised jurisdiction. There have been lay men who acted as judges in, in the ecclesiastical courts. The Munich School would say, well, that was all an aberration, and we should, we should change this. Vatican II did ch change this by saying, the power of order and jurisdiction for the bishops are united in the Sacra Potestas. The question is then, what does this mean for everybody else? Remarkable in this, um, and I just want to point that here in developments, in 1970, so we have to remember, until Vatican II, the notion of cleric was everybody who had received tonsure. Today, a cleric is somebody from deacon upwards. So the notion of cleric is already a different notion. In 1971, laymen could be appointed as judges in ecclesiastical courts, but they had to act together with two clerics. In 1983, this is opened to lay persons, so now the women are also included. And then in 2010, Pope Benedict makes a change with regard to the notion of cleric, 
And he does that implicitly by changing um, a canon saying that a deacon is not ordained in persona Christi Capitis. So now we have, but he's still a cleric. So we now have one, the one word cleric, but two different notions for that. We still have at that point two, the requirement of two clerics with one layperson. So the clerics can be deacons. And then in 2015, Pope Francis changes this and says, oh, it could be one cleric with two laypersons. Now imagine the group picture. In 1970, the group picture of the judges would have been three priests. In 2015, it could be a permanent deacon with wife and children, as well as two women. So there has been a tremendous change on the practical level, and regretfully, the systematic theologians around the world do not seem to have noticed this, and certainly are not reflecting about the theological implications of all these changes. By the way, this year, Pope Francis, just a few months ago, decided that cardinals and bishops, cardinals and bishops, um, when they are um, standing in court as accused, uh, in, this, in the courts of the Vatican City State can be judged by lay persons. So you can imagine a cardinal accused and three women on the other side. Um, <laughs> and then people say nothing is happening in the church. I think we have to reflect about this and we have to um, see what the implications are of these decisions. Um, and that would then include what does it mean to have a mandate by the bishop and also what does it mean, and I think uh, the systematic theologians have to help us, kind of lawyers, what, what does it mean to act in the name of the church and what does it mean to act in the name of Christ? And how should we differentiate between the two? That might also help. So I come to a next point, accountability in a synodal church. Is listening sufficient? Um, the upcoming synod refers a lot to the need to listen, listen, listen. We will be doing so much listening. Could it be that there is a blind spot in that there is no mention of accountability and transparency in the church? The scandals of spiritual, financial, and sexual abuse in the church have shown the need for a reflection on the topic of accountability and transparency. Not only is the Catholic Church insufficiently governed in a synodal way, those in authority are not excuse me, are not accountable for their decisions, except bishops to the Pope and priests to the bishops, but never to the people of God. And the management of the church affairs is often rather opaque. It would appear that there is a need to attend to this on the basis of a sound ecclesiology that takes its departure in baptism. It would be of interest to find out how accountability is understood and practiced in other churches and communities. the canonical aspect. I'm going to do this um, very briefly. Uh, the project of being a synodal church requires a conversion of all. What can be the contribution of canon lawyers and canon law in this? Pope Paul VI, already after the Second Vatican Council, at an address at the students of the Faculty of Canon Law at the Gregorian University said, you need to take on a new attitude of mind. So we must begin, any change must begin with the canon lawyers themselves having to go through the conversion. If they don't do that, if they don't go through the optician, I often say, and get new classes, nothing will happen. It won't happen in, in providing new legislation, and it won't happen in the interpretation. And I think many people are a little bit impatient with Pope Francis saying, why don't we get new structures? New structures will not help if they don't have other classes. So what is then necessary that the, the, the canon lawyers must study theology? And, and I think this too, there's still too much uh, canon lawyers who come from the field of law, nothing against the lawyers, but if you don't appreciate what's behind it, you, you cannot use the space that um, is also there. Um, also, after Vatican II and after the Code of Canon Law, its promulgation in 1983, there has been a theological development. So the question is then, how are new developments, for example, in the ecumenical dialogues, how do we use them in the interpretation of canon law? And that would then mean that we go to a progressive interpretation, progressive in the sense that is, it moves and it develops. That's not new. Development in interpretation 
has occurred in the past. Interestingly, if you talk, if I talk to canon lawyers who are a bit older and who were working between 65 and 83, they had the 1917 code, but they had to to use that code while while at the same time looking with the glasses of Vatican II, and they did that. They were able to do that, and now we seem to have a hard time doing that. It means also that what we call the mens legislatoris, so the intention of the legislator, we have to, to move away from thinking that this will, that this, what, was, what the legislator thought when he issued the law is still valid today. I think we have to attribute to the mens legislatoris a historical relevance, and then see what does it mean um, for the church of today. Because if you hold on to the mind of the legislator from 1983, you risk stiffening the community and to give old responses to new problems. In a way, the, the lawyers have also to move out, and we're still having in that process, from Suarez's understanding that the law is um, an ordinance expressing the will of the legislator, looking what does the legislator want, to we have to go to Aquinas, an ordinance, uh, the law is the ordinance of reason promulgated for the good of the community by the one who has the care for the community. So in the interpretation, this must be achieved. It allows for attributing an historical relevance to the will of the legislation, legislation and requires that the canon lawyers attend to the good of community. The interpretation has to be reasonable. The strength of the argument plays a decisive role. Hence, canonical terms can take on a new meaning or develop in their meaning. It implies that historicity and development enter the world of canon law. Canon law should be more creative. The possibility to introduce new institutions on the diocesan level and develop new ones for the entire church. That is possible, but they should do it. So do we have to sit and wait? I don't think we should. I'm going to finish, I know, one short story by a bishop who underwent a conversion. And I think it's a beautiful example of everything I was trying to say. I met this bishop in 2008. He was celebrating the 10th anniversary of being a bishop. He had just been transferred to the third diocese in his life to clean up after abuse. And he's a very good um, builder of trust. That's why he was sent to the third diocese. He and I studied together at the same time uh, in Ottawa, um, and he came to a lecture that I gave. It was actually about the people of God uh, and the bishop. And he said, Miriam, you know what? I have abandoned the diocese and pastoral council. I think it's a waste of time. Well, you think about it. And I said to him, do you actually celebrate the sacrament of confirmation? Of course, he said, I do. And I said, oh it's, oh, it's wonderful, all these young families and these kids, and it's really the church alive. So I said, what do you celebrate when you celebrate the sacrament of confirmation? Well, the Holy Spirit. Oh, I said, does, does the Holy Spirit work in your diocese? He said, well, how am I to know that? I said, well, why don't you establish a diocesan pastoral council? Because that is what it is for. He went home. And he established, again, the Diocesan Pastoral Council, because he had understood what it was about. I met him again two years ago, so that's more than 10 years later, and he said it has been the greatest change in my life. Not only do I have these people, I did not know how competent they are, how willing they are to share their resources, but also he said we prepare together the ad limina report, we take that as an occasion to see where are we, where do we want to go. And he said, and I have taken personal supervision to reflect for myself, how do I take decisions? And why do I take them? And um, he said, it's really remarkable. So it wasn't the law, but it was the internal appreciation that made him change his behavior. So thank you very much for your patience. Awesome presentation, uh, Professor Rylance. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this very clear and exhaustive picture of the of the scene and also, let's say, from within, in a sense. You showed us also what is behind the uh, drafting of the document and, and, and what is the, the mood of the process of the scene of itself. So thank you very, very much. And now we have about uh, 10 minutes before the break, and so you're all um, invited to ask questions. Uh, I would say, as we did this morning, 
for, to, for now, let's say, a question of clarification, and then we will have a broader discussion uh, at the end of the second session. So, of course, um, those in presence can just ask for the microphone. Uh, those of you who are following online, you are uh, asked to write your question on the chat or so that uh, we can take note of your question. Thank you very much. Please, and if you want, just introduce yourself. Je suis Thomas Pot du monastère de Chevetoigne et de l'atelier saint Ancel. Ma question pourrait venir un peu comme un cheveu dans la soupe après la. Would you mind speaking in English? Uh, I can try. How do you say cheveu dans la soupe in English? <laughs> so I, I think what I can I say now. It's reflecting also on this morning, so it's a bit like cheveu dans la soupe after your uh, intervention. Uh, my uh, doctor father, uh, Robert Taft, always liked to say things are things and words are words. No? Um, theology is one thing, uh, practice sometimes uh, seems to be something else. So, in line with what was said this morning, especially by uh, Father Amphilochius, I wonder in what measure it would be possible to discern models of synodality that really function today in our churches. So what church, what Orthodox church does best? Uh, which church has uh, the best model, so to say, and uh, manages to, um, to put it into practice? But linked to that, and that's more a question to you, uh, second question, um, what link would there be between culture um, and historical contextuality, one part, and the possible governmental model, uh, conceivable, practicable, on the other side, in a special, uh, in a specific place, you talked about inter uh, inculturation, no? and the importance of enculturation, you can't have the same model of synodality in every place. So, and that's maybe a question on a bit like uh, angry young man, uh, not that young, but if in the, the Catholic Church the concept of synodality is practically less democratical than in the Orthodox Churches, which still has to be proved, um, uh, would it be uh, another relic of this uh, feudal uh, culture, culture feudal, uh, which is so characteristic of our old European continent? Thank you. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, well, looking for the best model, I'm not sure if you mean best model with regard to Catholic, Protestant, Anglican, uh, Orthodox. That is one way of looking at it. The other is, I've mentioned this uh, also when the documents were presented, um, I was of course asked about what about the German model? Well, what do you think about that? And I said there, many roads lead to Rome. It's an expression in many languages. And Rome, in this case, is to be a more synodal church. So the German way is one way. The Australian way, which began last week with a plenary council, they choose very consciously for a plenary council, and they had a canonical problem that it was not ideal for the composition. So in 2016, I had a conversation with them, and, and I said, why don't you ask for a dispensation with regard to the composition, which they got. So the plenary council can also develop, and I think these are um, uh, moments. So it, it also means at the moment all these churches, Ireland is in a synodal uh, path council, the bishops of uh, the whole state of Quebec, which is four ecclesiastical provinces, are beginning a synodal path. We have the Salem in South America. So you have different levels in different cultures, different kind of groups. And we will have to listen to them and their experience, and I think they will have to evaluate what is, go what is good and what, what has to be improved. We also have to remember, we're doing this for the first time. 
So we should be patient with ourselves and allow ourselves to say, hmm, there, are, there is room for improvement here or there. Then you have different levels. So at that, um, I remember something that had a very deep and I think lasting and made a lasting impression on me was when a few years ago I was in Bombay and the, um, the Cardinal of Bombay, Cardinal Gracious, invited me to join him at the diocesan pastoral council session. And we came in a room with about 130 people, there are 125 parishes, every parish sends one person. What was interesting was not just that the people knew who the cardinal was, but the cardinal knew who all these people were. And he said, hey, Peter, how are you? How did the surgery go? And Mary, is your grandchild, was it born? And is it a boy or a girl? And so he went with everybody and he knew the details of all these people. And you could see a bishop who was governing, leading his diocese, but he was part of that whole group. And then they had a session there that afternoon, it was about communication, and for me it was, it was very impressive, the way they interacted with each other. You could feel um, people journeying on the way, trying to find the best solutions for their, for their diocese. And then I learned that in Bombay, every 10 years since Vatican II, they have had a diocesan um, uh, synod. Now, in the country where I'm from, in the Netherlands, I don't think we had any synods for Dioceses. I might be taken wrong, but as far as I'm aware, there has not been any of that. So what can we learn from these churches? And the cardinal told me, oh, these synods don't last for, for months or for weeks or whatever. They are short sessions, uh, not too long. And we take one subject, like the youth or uh, marriage with non-Christians, which is a major issue over there. So the subjects there are also very different. So we will have to see what are the subjects, and we will have to give that space. If you live in a diocese where there are very few people, and which is a very fast territory, it will be very different from uh, a diocese where basically everybody is Catholic and you all live in one, in one context. So in that sense, I think we have to learn from and between the churches. Uh, personally, being involved in receptive ecumenism, I think this would be a wonderful project for receptive ecumenism by which we also would have to investigate when you have a synodal church what is the theological basis of the participation of the different groups so it's not just on the operative level um, but um, how does that work so I, I hope that I have, I have um, responded to some of your implicit questions Sorry to, um, to insist. Uh, what I wanted, to, what I was referring to, is the Orthodox critic on our Catholic um, way of synodality. So, in the uh, uh, the uh, Catholic Orthodox uh, uh, dialogue, uh, one of the uh, the Orthodox members told me, "You are always to talking about you Catholics are always talking about synodality, but since there is not the power of uh, decision making, that's not really synodality." And that's what Father Amphilochius was insisting on this morning, and my question was more in, in link with that. So, um, are we going towards something which the Orthodox would recognize also? Well, I think we will have to look into that, what that means. And of course, I mean, the supreme synodal structure in our church is, is a council. And that is decision making. So the diocese, the, 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 the um, synod of bishops, which, which is now going, but the Synod of Bishops um, um, was an institution to inform, and because there was a fear, that's how it came about, that it was an advisory, uh, if you like, an, a consultative vote. Now the question will then, of course, be, what does a Pope, even with a consultative vote, what do you do with that? What do you do with that? Do you deny that, or do you say there is insufficient maturity, or do you follow up on that? So we should be careful, because the, the, the synod of bishops is not a synod in that sense that it is indeed a, dis, a, a, a decisive decision. A plenary council is different. So again, we have to ask, why don't we look at a plenary council? Because there we do make decisions. Now, plenary councils are thought to, to issue legislation. So it's something different when it comes to more practical or pastoral questions. So these are synodal structures with suffragan bishops and, um, and metropolitans. In the ecclesiastical province, you can have a, a provincial council. 
So in that sense, the Synod of Bishops, though it has the word Synod, but the question is if it is a Synod in the true sense or not. Thank you very much. I, yes, Professor Legrand wants perhaps to say something. Need a I think we can stop for uh, this session, but please, Professor Legrand. I have two questions. One very easy. You seem uh, quite at ease with the preparatory documents, and you never mentioned what was missing, in my opinion, in those documents. The word canon law is never mentioned. It means that you ask very, very general questions into the diocese, and then the answers may go everywhere. And that may create deception. Let's think about the similar way in Germany. They are very precise uh, questions. But here you have no mention of, of, of structures changing, of, um, yes, of, of reform. Uh, the word law, canon law, has disappeared. As a canonist, you seem very at ease with that, and then very, very, very shortly. My other question is very different and probably needs more development. I would like you to precise what you say about transparency. If you may allow me to be joking, I would say transparency is a quality for glasses of windows. But I am not sure that transparency in human relations, even in church relations, is at any time something very, very important. And then I would like you to uh, comment a little bit about what you understand by transparency as a quality. Thank you very much. I think I am, with regard to the document at this point, quite satisfied because I think we made so many changes uh, implicitly that um, with including the local church as being part of, of the synodal process now, of the inquibus and exquibus, the going back and forth, I think these are achievements that, that um, uh, to me are incredible that we have uh, made them. With regard to the structures, there would also be the problem, as the Pope said the other day, you could fall into formalism. And bishops would say, yes, we do have a diocesan pastoral council, but you would not know how they function. And there are bishops who, in Germany, you know the word quite well, a German uh, presbyteral council is priesterrat. And the priests go there to to um, um, to erraten, yeah, to guess what the bishop has already decided. The bishop will tell you, I have a presbyteral council. We meet ten times a year, um, and I prepare the, the you know the minutes with them, and um, it's wonderful. It would not say anything, and I think that is why we are also looking into the experience, because too many bishops. What I also found interesting was the episcopal conferences are. Re requested to send in the report of the dioceses nevertheless. Because there is an awareness that bishops kind of clean up the report. Transparency, I would, uh, just um, because of the time also, I would say, I would wish that as a canon lawyer, and I'm also now talking from my, my work in the Pontifical Commission for Minors, um, there is more information. Uh, there is um, uh, also information on, on the reasoning of why do we do certain things and not just we have decided um, and, uh, you know, a priest or a bishop is dismissed without um, clear grounds. and Or maybe it might be known to him, but not to the community. And then the people will say that people cannot accept it anymore. People do want to understand. I was just in, in Poland at a conference on um, for 20 Episcopal conferences of Eastern Europe. And um, in Poland, 10 bishops have been dismissed because of not handling properly sexual abuse of minors. In Germany, no bishop is, is being dismissed. So on both sides, in Poland it's a disaster because they don't understand why are they dismissed, because there are not a clear reasoning given, and in Germany they are not dismissed, but the people also don't understand how they came to this conclusion. So with transparency I mean we have to have some reasoning, because we're adult people, 
and if we cannot appreciate the reasoning, the time is over where we appreciate Suarez, the time is over, the mind of, of the legislator or of the superior. So let's move to Thomas Aquinas' Dominican tradition. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Rylance. Thank you, all of you. We will reconvene in time, uh, in 15 minutes, which means 4.35. We have time for a tea break rather than a coffee break at this time. So in 15 minutes. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you.